I mean, <clears throat> she, I think, thinks that you and I have very high-level discussions about matters of deep philosophy and concern about the how to save our the world. collective failure to change yeah. the world. No, that's what I'd say. One question: What hope is there? Is there any hope? You've seen this debt crisis thing lately. How do we maintain hope without taking too many drugs? Hope is the thing with feathers. Is that it? Mm. Is that it? Hope is the thing with feathers. Like Isn't that what somebody not, that's said? That's a quote, yes. Hope is the thing with feathers? It's a line from a famous poem. Mm -hmm. And now many people have used it as title for movies and TV movies. Um, or how did you get to India? That's more the kind of question I can answer than whether there's any hope. <laughs> yeah, that was a tough one. <laughs> I'm an optimistic sort of person. But I must say that right along through here, I'm at a pretty low ebb uh, because of the. There have always been disparities in this society and unfairness, but the extent of the disparities today and the ease with which we accept them and don't question them is very troublesome to me. I heard an interesting thing the other day on my favorite alternative radio station, <laughs> Pacifica Radio. Um, it was a call-in program. The person was asking about the latest Pew study, uh, which indicated that white people had 20 times, oh, the, what would it say, the, uh, in their household. is the median, the median uh, figure is that uh, white people had 20 times the wealth of black people and 18 times the wealth of what they call Hispanics. That word doesn't come easily to me. Uh, it's Spanish-speaking people. This caller pointed out that this kind of statistic, well, you know, it grabs our attention, and I reacted to it. He said, this is a divisive report, because the really important thing is that 1% of the population owns 50% of the wealth. And then that cuts the whole thing differently, doesn't it? Who cares what your ethnic group is? There's them and all the rest of us, you know? <laughs> and it, 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 it reminds me of how in the South, when the, they were trying to start labor unions, whenever they began to get a little traction, then they would find a case where they would claim a black man raped a white woman. And the subject is changed completely, you know? That's troublesome to me. I think that the, the Tea Party movement was troublesome to me, but again, uh, that really may be a cry of pain, and you know, in a, in a different direction, but an indication of we're tired of being so hopeless in this, in this situation. Back to how did I get to India? Hmm. I'm sorry, that was my fault. But at no, least no. it was a big question. No, it's all right. And thank you for starting, Father. I have to think some more about that. I'm getting a little bit tired of talking about myself, but oh, I will God. do it for one or two minutes more. Well, what was great about that time that you guys went out there? I mean, now people like are discovering these places as tourist destinations, <laughs> but for Americans to go yeah. in the 50s yeah. and give their lives in... There are, two, there are two points there. One is the simple point of how I got there. Um, I became acquainted with Quakers uh, during World War II when I was at Yale. And in some way that I have, still don't understand, 
I got uh, converted to the idea of nonviolence, which became a sort of lifelong thing for me. It was very unnatural um, uh, to me. I really struggled against it. But anyway, I became acquainted with Quakers, and, and when I graduated from, from Yale, I attended a, participated in a, the first interracial work camp in the South, sponsored by the American Friends Service Committee, mm -hmm. 1944. Um, but later, I, well, at that time, I said to myself, I am a Johnny come lately to the whole idea of nonviolence and pacifism. But when this war is over, I'd like to work for peace. So I was teaching at Wellesley in the late 50, 40s, early 50s, and they were testing atomic bombs. And in those days, to me, that was really scary. I can remember the very day when they dropped the first atomic bomb. I was in Nashville, and I felt like the world was going to end. I just didn't have words to, you know, to express it. So it had always troubled me, and they were testing these things again. And I began to get, while well, I loved it at Wellesley and teaching at Wellesley, I began to get very rested. What were you teaching? Sociology and anthropology. And I decided that I should approach the American Friends Service Committee and ask them if they had any work for me, because I wanted to work for peace, and that was one organization I knew that was doing it. And to, I thought they would send me, you know, to, I don't know, an Indian reservation or inner city Chicago or something, mm -hmm. Appalachia. So they asked me if I would like to go to, to Europe. And my French wasn't good enough. And my German wasn't good enough. They said, well, what about Pakistan and India? And I said, great. Being a, you know, a sociologist, anthropologist, I said, look, I can work in another culture and you know, enrich my <laughs> sort of academic life. So that's, that's how I did it. They said, OK, we'd like to send you to what was then called East Pakistan, to the town called Dhaka. Never heard of it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Didn't know anything about East Pakistan. But I went anyway in uh, 1952. It forced me to finally finish my dissertation. Up until that time, I think I was the only member of the faculty of Wellesley huh. in the catalog who only had a BA <laughs> and many years of graduate work. <laughs> anyway, um, so I worked with a friend in, uh, in Taka for a while, a friend center. It was then a Mafasal town, you know, mm, as they call it. The word. it the main means of transportation in those days were uh, cycle rickshaws. There were some buses and a few cars, but really, and it was a different time. I mean, you know, if you went to the airport, way out to the airport, you'd go to a cycle rickshaw and this guy had this flickering lamp, which was his headlight, and he'd be cycling along, creaking. He's looking at his thumb. Yeah, yeah, it was amazing. Anyway. I worked there for a while, maybe six months, and then the American Vent Service Committee transferred me to Calcutta, Calcutta as we say, uh, to start a program of international seminars. So I did that. And in the process of these international seminars were three-week residential seminars run on a shoestring. And I would find all the foreign students I could find, because I didn't have money to bring them there, who were in the country. And, you know, some Americans, some Europeans, some Pakistanis I, I, I helped come. And uh, 
we would live together and we would talk about some topic presumably related to peace. And one of those that I organized was in a village project run by the Quakers for many years in central India, Madhya Pradesh, Hoshangabad. And I used to, when these seminaries, I would get experts to come as resource people. And um, so at that seminar, I was, the subject was community development. <laughs> it was new. And um, <laughs> so I had a friend in, in Calcutta who was the development commissioner, an ICS man named Shushio Day. <coughs> so I invited him and he came. He was an, he was an unusual man. Mm. And I had another friend who was one of the early advisors, American advisors, an agricultural advisor, named Jack Gray from Texas. And I invited him. And there were other people. I invited a Gandhian economist and a number of other people. The Gandhian, the Gandhian economist, among other remarks that he made there was, um, I will be happy when I see the trunks of the Americans being loaded into the ships in Bombay. <laughs> I thought, look, I paid this guy's fare and everything. <laughs> but anyway, in this, after this um, seminar, which was um, unusual in those days, because people were used to, you know, seminars in which people gave lectures and things like that. This is one in which we emphasized discussion and called on resource people to help us. At the end of this, this friend of mine who was the development commissioner, Shushil Day, said, I want you to come and work in my office. He said, how can I work in your office? I'm a foreigner. He said, never mind. He said, you have an approach that I think would be useful. And here's where it related to your, your bigger question. This was 1953 or something like that. And India got its independence in 1947. And it was in the throes of, as we used to say in those days, trying to change the government from a law and order revenue collecting government, a colonial government, to a kind of social welfare government. A terrific effort you know, to, to transform a whole bureaucracy. And India really had that. So this man thought, Shushio, that this method of training might be effective in sort of altering the ways of operating of some civil servants who were in this community development program. A very legitimate concern that he had. Anyway, to make a long story short, mm. As uh, I got near the end of my term with the friends, he came to me again and said, I want you to come. And I said, how can I come? You know, I'm, I'm a foreigner. So he said, you know, I found a way. What's that? He's, he's, he said, you know, there's an, org an American organization in Delhi that sends experts to India. And I want you to meet these people and maybe they will send you to work with me. Can you imagine? He's recruiting me to work with my own government. So I was very reluctant because I had, you know, I was a young man. I had a lot of critical views about the government. And I had signed a few petitions and been to a few meetings <laughs> and so on. I had supported third party oh. candidates. So anyway, I went there sort of cynically. And I met the people there. And I was so impressed with the three people in this office that I was ashamed of myself for being so arrogant. One of them had worked in TVA, you know, which in those days was a really experimental project. Mm -hmm. Tennessee one, Valley Authority? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And one was uh, an anthropologist who lived for a long time. Anyway. So they, they said, yeah, they'd like to 
to hire me. And uh, make a long story short, I applied. I got married. I came home, expecting to return in three months. They lost my papers in Washington, <laughs> third world country, and I had to get after them, and then they found them, and so on. But I went back as a rural community development advisor to West Bengal. And it was an exciting time, you're right, because it was a time when India was trying to remake itself. And this is a, a remarkable time because the whole country accepted the idea of community development. And we would talk about reaching five lakh villages, 500,000 villages with this program. Wow. I mean, that was the goal. And I often think about it today because our, our conception of development is so much narrower. Yep. Whoever talks about universal coverage, you know? But we started out with that assumption. Now he gave me a book to look at called The Guaranteed Income. Oh. <laughs> As if, but, you know, and I can't believe there was a, you could even find a publisher for such a thing. <laughs> it was only in 69. But in the, this was true in India, the Philippines had a national program and uh, a few other places. And eventually this young man got a program organized in Nepal. Well, I'm thinking of even Pakistan, VA. And Pakistan, that was a good program, VA. Yeah. yeah. As long as the field marshal yeah. said it was going to be a good program. And, in, and he worked in Laos and so on. Um, so it was exciting times because, you know, there were serious people who wanted to remake their countries. And there's still all the old bureaucracy existing. But anyway, that's how I got into it. I met, when I went with the friends, I meant to go for two years and go back to teaching. And then this guy, you know, offered me this possibility. I thought, well, interesting experience. So I, so I Went for two more years, and by then I was sort of trapped. Was that USAID? No. Yeah, but we had a different name for it in India. Sorry. It was called, in India it was called, well first of all the organization wasn't called USAID, then it was called ICA, International Cooperation Administration. And in India it was called Technical Cooperation Mission. ICM. But it's what we now call it, USAID. Perhaps Mr. Perhaps the, Dr. Cool would like to say something on this subject. Well, I think maybe we break here, Jenny. Sure. And, uh,